Am I looking good? Was it, was it, was it, was it Everybody ready to go? Well, we're going to get this thing started. Here's the uh, 2018 Master Clinic for the whole state of Colorado. We're, we're going to uh, we're, uh, videotaping everything. So, uh, a little loud. Who gave you a mic? I don't know. Can you turn this up? Is that better? Is that too loud now? Are you all right now? I can't hear you, so I mean, I need to talk about it. All right, I'm going to get this started. We're going to be here about three hours. We're going to take a little break. We've got a pretty good little thing. We're going to start with Kevin Kaczynski, president of uh, our state. And uh, we're going to get started. So, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, John, for the opportunity to be here today and uh, share some thoughts with you. Uh, before we begin, um, I would just like to take a short moment of silence and remember those officials who have passed on before us. Yeah, set the path for basketball. <laughs> Thank you. One of the biggest joys I have about being in the position I, I'm in is uh, recognizing members of our organization for their outstanding accomplishments. Would Gary Martell please join me in a parent's meeting? On behalf of the IABLE and Carl Gordon Ford, it is with great pride and admiration that we congratulate and recognize an individual who is nominated at the IABLE Fall Conference for the IABLE Lifetime Membership Award. This is the highest award bestowed upon an IABLE member. Today, we celebrate Gary Montel and his collective contributions and services to IABLE and Carl Gordon Ford. Gary will be recognized and receive his award at the April Spring Meeting in April. Gary, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> this past summer, beginning the fall, this past summer and beginning the fall, uh, your executive board and area directors have been instrumental on making this event happening today. One single master clinic streamlined statewide. I am thankful for our regional directors, Shelly Rush, Kim Newman, John Gleason, and Kirby Clock. All their time, energy, and effort to help make this take place today. I commend each of you on an outstanding job. Earlier this year, I came across a short read that had some lasting impressions on my life. This book is called The Four Agreements. I believe that the agreements can be applied to many of our lives on a daily basis. Those four agreements are, number one, be impeccable with your word. Speak with integrity. Say only what you mean. Avoid using your word to speak against yourself or gossip against others. Number two, don't take anything personal. Nothing other, nothing others do is because of you. What others say and do is a projection of their own reality, their own dream. Number three, don't make assumptions. Find the courage to ask questions and to express what you really want. Communicate with others as clearly as you can to avoid misunderstandings, sadness, and drama. Number four, always do your best. Your best is going to change from moment to moment based upon whether you're healthy or sick. Under any circumstance, simply do your best and 
you will avoid self-judgment, self-abuse, and regret. Again, I want to thank John Gleason and the Denver area once again for having me here. I want to wish each of you a great season, much health, and safe journeys throughout your season. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Now we're going to bring up Bert and Tom from Chester. Uh, Good morning. Welcome to Mile High Madness. Activities Association uh, is uh, working on doing some things to uh, brand basketball, and you are going to start to see some uh, things related to Mile High Madness, and that's our state basketball tournament. And I hope you all will be a part of it. But uh, today we're going to start with a couple of uh, items you can kind of move to follow me along to the third column. Uh, I'm going to let Kirby catch up with me, but uh, today we're going to just talk a few things from my, my end, which is I'm going to introduce the basketball committee, talk briefly about the playoffs, uh, just a couple of professionalism reminders, and some uh, talk a little bit about uh, the unwritten rules of officiating. And then Tom will come up and uh, take uh, some other, uh, take the other piece to it. Yeah. I got a new toy, so watch out. Actually, I need to watch out on that. Uh, from the basketball committee side, Sean O'Donnell from Ghosts Springs is our chair. And the reason I want you all to know who is on the basketball committee is because I think it's important that uh, our school personnel and our officials are talking to each other. If you have some things that you feel like you need to talk about uh, for the basketball committee, don't hesitate to reach out to these folks. They're all good folks. Uh, Sarah Crawford out of Kid Carson, uh, Luke DeWolf up in Steamboat. Mike Cox is a Shiny Mountain Waldorf. Randy Kirkwood is up at Caliche. Russ McKinstry at uh, Hooter School District. Chris Knoll is at uh, District 11 in Colorado Springs. Mike Union out of the mountain region uh, in Middle Park. Angie Sanders is out of uh, Jeffco and Conifer. Pete Sheck from Longmont. Uh, Nate Smith is at Inglewood, and Jim Thiefault is uh, at Jefferson County Schools. All of these people have a vested interest in the success of our sport. And they all believe that officials are critical to that success. So don't ever hesitate to chat with them. They'd love to talk with them. All right. Just some real quick notes for the end of the season. The postseason application deadline will be January 27th, which is a Sunday. You'll get a lot of emails related to that. Area directors are going to certify those eligible officials by Monday. And then we'll have the video re review and mechanics test over a two week period from January 14th to February 2nd. No big deal right there. No changes in our state, the, our state sites. Uh, we hope that uh, within the next two years we have a, an announcement about the 45A tournament and a new facility that may be built in Denver. Uh, so we'll go, from, we'll go at that point, but we'll be back at the University of Northern Colorado in a 2 and at Budweiser Event Center for 1A and 2A. Uh, Hamilton Gym at DU and then the Denver Coliseum uh, for both 4A and 5A. 5A grade 8 will be at the Coliseum, 4A grade 8 will be at the home sites in 4A. Let's talk a little bit about the professionalism piece. Always look at the parents. How do you present yourself? What's your demeanor? Do you exude confidence, confidence without cockiness? Or are you calm during tense situations? Reliability. 
Can you be counted on to get the job done? Are you on time? Competence. Strive to be the expert. Do the things that constantly, do you do the things that constantly improve your abilities? Ethics. Do you display ethical behavior at all times? If I have anybody that contacts my office about an official, about 30% of those questions are all about the ethics of that official and their relationship to other teams that maybe this team had been playing. So put that in the back of your mind. Boys, don't play the games of retribution. Remember, you represent basketball, you represent your colleagues, you represent Chasta, and you represent yourself. And if you remember those four items of who you're representing, you'll get along just fine. Accountability. Are you accountable for the actions on the floor? Are you accountable for the calls that you make? Can you let a coach know that you made a mistake? We all have to admit those. I've made so many, I've, it's now a hobby. We talk about the written rules and those are most important. I came across an article in Referee Magazine in July which I thought was uh, an excellent read for anybody who has anything to do with sports. But, uh, so I thought I would save it and, and talk a little bit about it today. And it says, uh, when you think you saw something, you really didn't. Gut feelings are valuable in officiating, but your eyes are gonna trump all. See what you call and call what you see. Period. Whoops, I'm gonna go back. The captain isn't always the team leader, right? How many of us have seen that, you know? It's not always the person that the coach says is, has been appointed the captain. If the captain isn't a positive force, tell the coach to appoint another player or simply tell the player that he or she will no longer be recognized as a captain. The captains need to be a positive force on the floor. I'm gonna keep bouncing, I told you this is a new toy. Uh, keep the game moving. It's not acceptable for officials to be the reason the game goes longer than it needs to. Do everything possible to keep that game moving. We know that there are going to be games that are going to drag, but don't you be the reason for it. Provide the courtesy to the players when it is needed most. Now this is sometimes more relevant in baseball or, or one of the others. But while you want to keep the game moving, there'll be times when you're going to need to slow it down. When tensions are high, take a moment before you put the ball in play. And use that time to provide some preventive officiating as opposed to issuing a premature penalty or a penalty that you could have avoided. And then give a longer leash to those who are in charge. Perhaps the most important part of this rule is those who aren't in charge don't get the long leash. Listen to the head coach as long as they don't cross the line. Communication is what we're after. But assistant coaches, players, and other bench personnel should not be given the same patience or privilege that you give the head coach. Address any issues right away. All unsportsmanlike issues need to be addressed immediately. You set the tone for the game. Number six is give the benefit of, doubt, of the doubt to those who have earned the respect. Think about the coach who questions every call. Now think about the coach who coaches his players, rarely questioning calls. Who deserves the benefit of the doubt? 
But I caution you to make sure that when there is confusion and explanation is needed, make sure you bring both coaches together and provide that explanation. They both need to know. Look the coaches in the eye. When you're introducing yourself to the coaches before the game or, after, or answering a question during play, communication should be done face to face and straight on. That gives you credibility and respect. What do police officers say when they're questioning somebody and that person's always looking someplace else? Well, yeah, there might be some guilt there somewhere. Let the coaches in the eye. When in doubt, do what is expected. There are times when an official faces doubt at the, mo at the moment he or she is expected to make a call or no call. When that happens, it is best to do what is expected. Block or charge, rule one way or the other. Don't try to run away from the play and shrug your shoulders. You'll lose credibility fast if you do that. Answer questions, not statements. And this is a hard one because they're going to try and pick at you. But coaches talk a lot during the game. I know you don't believe that, but they do. Most of it doesn't need a response. Statements don't need an answer. What deserves a respectful response when time allows is the legitimate question. Answer only what is asked. <coughs> don't answer the question you don't have information about. We all want to be helpful. Everything that we do, we want to be helpful. Not every question gets an answer though. If a call was made by another official and not in your coverage area, and if you don't know what happened, don't guess. Suggest the coach ask your partner the next time an opportunity arises. Get the game going after a mistake or ejection. Ejection and mistakes are big deals. But you're responsible to make sure they don't become a huge deal and negatively impact the game. It happened, it's been taken care of, get the game going. Crew ties should lean toward the official with the angle or the experience. Coverage areas overlap. And there are times when we have differing calls. The officials involved need to be certain of what they call. I think isn't going to get it done. If both officials insist they have the correct call, consider the angle or proximity to the play. Position and distance are key factors. If there remains an impasse, you can lead toward the official that has more experience, who has likely seen that play more often and knows how best to go. Doesn't happen very often, but when it does, you need to be able to come to a conclusion and not spend a lot of time on it. Be 100% sure if you're making the unexpected call. If it needs to be called, sell it and be prepared to back it up with confidence. The more unusual the situation, the more sure you have to be. Don't insert yourself or disrupt the game rhythm if it's not necessary. Let the plays develop themselves. Don't be that official with the quick whistle looking for something or any kind of vet violation or foul to make it look like you're in the game. Let the plays happen and make the calls as needed. Let the players help you make the call. Generally, players are not award-winning actors. Reading a player's initial reaction in many plays sometimes helps when you need it, but don't depend on it, but it can help sometimes. And when the game is obviously over, concentration needs to be stronger. And folks, the way things are going in high school basketball, we're seeing greater gaps between those that have and those that don't have. So we may see some of these, we know the game is over quickly. So in our sport, there are times when the games are decided early on. A 
blowout situation is often sufficient to perfect time to work on certain mechanics and habits. Don't be the official who goes through the motions just because the players are. Those are some unwritten rules. Those are some things to think about that I thought were interesting and wanted to share with you today. I have one last message for all of you. If you have any game management issues at any schools, Tom and I need to know about them. We can't address those issues if we don't know about it. Thank you. Have a great season. There's a question from Area 17. Uh, the question is, is the five-year limit for state playoff games still in effect, i.e. work five straight playoff games and take a year off? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. There you go, Tom. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's a nice turnout. Uh, and the fact that uh, we got all these satellites everywhere is pretty impressive. So thanks for being here. Uh, I'm just going to take a few minutes just to talk about, uh, you saw on the slide, the last slide, about recruiting and retention real quickly, and then uh, talk about gaining fees and and really uh, the expenses to that, uh, just talking about the schools and, and how they process uh, uh, raising gain fees. Before I start though, I think the, the hot topic, as you all know, uh, across the country is, is recruiting and retention. And recently the NASO, the National Association of Sports Officials, uh, put out a survey, a survey about they were trying to survey maybe 500 officials and ended up surveying about 17,000. And, and the nice thing about that is that that's a good uh, number of officials uh, says that you can rely on the data. And it's, it's, really, it's really very, very good information. Um, you, you, all of you can go even on your phones to uh, naso.org and, and that survey will be there. Uh, it's got so many data points that it's very, very difficult to, uh, uh, to process in a session like this unless that's all we're doing. So we're not going to look at that. But I'm going to look at some, some of the highlights. I'm going to have Kirby help me with that. Look at some of the highlights, uh, some of the, the default filters that, uh, uh, that are there. The first one is uh, this demographic one. If you look at this, No, it's not. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> anyway, the demographic is really going to tell you about who you are. And uh, you are, in the survey, a, a white male uh, that uh, is about between 50 and 60 years old. That's our officiating data right now of the 17,000, all right? So what does that say? That simply says that it's a, it's a brain organization, right? We look around, right? Do we have any 21-year-olds that are, are sitting next to us now like they were in 1970? No, right? They're all uh, much, much older. So why is, it, why is that is really what I'd like for you to do as individuals, because the responsibility for recruiting and retention is not the state office, it's not the IA executive board, although all of us are trying to do our part, it's all of our interest in making this work. And so everyone can, can do their part. And once you know what's, what's going on, and that's the slide there, that deals with that demographic, and you can see that, you can see what's going on. It also talks about your education and how smart you are as well. In Colorado, a little bit smarter uh, in terms of master's degrees and bachelor's degrees, uh, but there's only a small number of Colorado officials that actually took the survey. But the survey itself still talks about 
of how good we are. All right? So what's good about a survey is, is that you can start to create strategies, real strategies around how you can fix it. And hopefully we can. I hope it's not one of those things where it's irreversible. Uh, and we can't, you know, kind of keep getting the influx of new officials. We need to figure out how to do that. And I'm sure there's many of you that are in this audience today that are much smarter than I am. I'm just doing what I think uh, should be happening. Um, so there's a, there's a couple other slides that I want you to look at. There's one about, about uh, how officials get paid, uh, officiating income, and what you say about that. You really say that you would do this, right, if someone really kind of paid attention to paying you what you're worth. You're not paying what you're worth, that's clear. All right? But have, have some respect for that and, and at times pay attention to it and, and, and pay us, try to pay us what we're worth. That's what the officials are saying. All right? And we'll talk, excuse me, I'll talk a little bit uh, uh, later about that, okay? As, that's what we're doing in Colorado. The other side is sportsmanship, because we always talk about fan behavior and that being the issue in terms of why officials leave. Uh, but what's interesting about it is it, it talks about uh, fans being the, probably the, uh, the most egregious in terms of, of sporting behavior. But then the other side of the coin, it talks about who can fix that, and that's the coach. The coach is the one that they say is the only one that can really fix sporting behavior because they're out in front. So whose responsibility is that? That's going to be that's going to be Bert and our responsibility at Chasta in terms of getting that done. And we're going to work our butts off to, to make sure that that, that happens. Um, I think recently, even last year, we did uh, some things uh, that were kind of no-brainers and that, that you know, official appreciation types of things that. Really, uh, we should have been doing or exercising a long time ago because they really do have a great impact and have an effect on, on how, how you view what you do and how you like, uh, like officiating. Uh, the last one is um, how did you get started? How did all of you get started? And really, in most cases, it happened because you. Ask somebody to officiate. You did. You just ask someone. Now, I don't know, you know, you can think about what's going on here. So if I'm 70 years old and I'm not around high school kids all the time, who am I going to ask to officiate? Another 70 year old, probably? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm just thinking that that's the case because I'm, I'm just wondering how the young kids actually started officiating. We had to be around them. We asked them to do that. And that's not the case anymore. We're not in buildings anymore. It used to be coaches and athletic directors. And that's how it happened. So we need to figure out some kind of strategy in terms of who we're asking and, and then how we follow up. Because the other bar says it's, it's a mentor that brought us into this profession. A mentor. You know, I had a mentor, and then he spent every day with me talking about officiating. That's how I got hooked and, and really it, it propelled me to where I am today. So it's really kind of creating strategies around that. So if you, you could go on to, the, to that side, look at that. Um, Look at everything that they have there in terms of the survey. You can, you can come up with any culture you want. Um, but the other part of it is they have another tab on that side that says, that says say yes to officiate. And that's what all of us have to do. We have to be proud of what we do because we're, I can only assume that you're here today because you like officiating basketball and, and that's what you're planning on doing. And so you need to say yes to officiating. And you need to say yes to officiating to everybody that you reach out to. Okay, that's, that, that's critical. And on that site, the yes to officiating tab will give you all the information about how uh, an official can get started. 
That's how we get an ASO slot. Um, I'm going to move on real quickly to um, a survey that I took uh, two years ago, just just looking at the trends of where we were we were heading in terms of numbers. So we've gone since uh, 2000, 2010 for us. It's gone from about 5,200 down to 4,500. That's for all of our businesses. Uh, in Michigan, in a recent article, uh, for the last nine years, they had a trend. You know, they've gone from 12 down to 9,000. And so that's that's the trend. I don't, I don't know if that's you know irreversible. I don't know what that is or we're going to get to a point where we just we're, we're right at a number. And that's that's uh, we're using that number to, to officiate our meetings. I don't know where we are. So we need some help. So I'm just reaching out to you to kind of hear this uh, this message and see where you can help. I think all of us can help. Anyway, the survey that I took, uh, uh, I used this information to try to uh, kind of create some strategies. And you can see the, the longest bar is about what? The, the time it takes to officiate. And then the you got career demands. And so you have a different demographic. It's not educators anymore. They're in the building. They're outside. Uh, doctors, lawyers, right, that are now officiating. And that, it really does take a lot of time to become an official. Um, I was at a meeting uh, this, this past week, and we had a lawyer that came in to speak, and he says when he goes to his office, he's in the SC, uh, the uh, Big Ten, he says that when he turns on his computer, he's looking at video in his office. He says that he spends the majority of his time on the officiating piece, as opposed to what he does with his job. And that's reality. And that's, what, that's, that, that's the kind of time we spend. It really does demand a lot of our time. So one of the excuse me, uh, one of the things around that we were hearing from officials that God, you're asking us to do ten different things in order to be eligible for postseason, and we back off on that. It just doesn't make any sense, right? You have to pay your pay your dues to your association. You have you have to pass the test. You have to have a background check. Uh, we ask you to maybe officiate what one game a week during the season, which totals to what twelve games. It's kind of that kind of a piece where we're we're not trying to put too many demands on you. So so we heard that at, at one point or another. Um, you can see uh, officiating A at this next, right? Okay, so we we really we got to pay attention to that, and I can tell you we. And you try to do that in the best way you can. I don't, I don't pay the fees, right? Our schools pay the fees, and I can only trust what they tell me about their budgets. I can't do more. Now, I would tell you this, that if, if somebody is advocating a walkout, right, I you know, I kind of I try to go to the background. I don't get to the foreground and try to stop people from doing that because I don't, I don't know where the pressure is to get that done. Now I'm not advocating that that's what you do because I don't think that's, that's counterproductive to what we do. But we are trying to get things done relative to pay. All right? So that, that leads me to really what I wanted to talk about as a plan. So you need to know where we are. I don't know if some of you really know. So 2018-19, there was a $2 increase. All sports. So when you think about, if you just think about basketball, then you get that's a tunnel vision in terms of how we deal with paying officials. Because when we when we raise fees, we raise fees for all sports, and that's a significant hit on budgets. So you just need to know that. So it's two dollars this year. Then then we had a meeting a year ago because this this is what happens. Our schools tell us that they need to plan. In order to to make those changes, they need a year out at least. Okay, so next year there's going to be a one dollar increase for all three, for three person basketball, soccer, and then five person football. That's next year. Okay, it doesn't seem like much, but in two years that's three dollars for basketball. I talked to Mike Book. I think you all know Mike. 
right? My book is in chair of the official speech committee. And we are, we are, our strategy is to be bolder about this as we can. And we've kind of floated it out, Bert did it the other day to our district and other directors in the natural area. We haven't done it to the whole state. But our, our plan is to take three person basketball to the same level as two person basketball. Now that's, that's a significant change from like 52 to 60. Right, for basketball, we can do that. Then what we want to do is we heard this too about windshield wiper time. And, and that sounds like something uh, in the rural areas, but it's really what happens when you're in the metro traffic too, right? So it's, it's exactly the same thing. So we're talking about a significant increase from that two dollars to be seven for travel. Within the metro area. So now we're talking about it's pretty bold, like, I don't know, 12 to 13 dollars in an increase. That's what we're talking about. All right? Now, I know that I remember last year when Don came in, right? And Don DiGiori, uh, I know it was a spokesperson for the, the metro area. And we went through with the, uh, uh, we went through with the, the district athletic directors. And I know it's a rude awakening because he heard what I, I hear all the time. They just don't have the money. And you know, Colorado education is at the bottom, they're at the bottom of the run, just like official state is at the bottom of the run. I don't know how you deal with that. I just hope people are honest about what the budgets are. That's all. I don't know that, okay, for sure. So we're going to put some pressure on them to make that happen. So that's our plan going forward. Because there's a lot of things floating out there. If we're not listening, we're not paying attention, we're not serious about what we're doing, but the schools are serious about it, and I think they really do want to make some changes. So really, uh, uh, the last part is really what I wanted to, to share with you. I, don't, I can't guarantee you anything, because it's not, my, not writing the checks. We write them for playoffs, we do that, and we're doing some significant things with that, with the payment from the grade A and on. So, we're, we're taking a hit at, at the chassis level as well. Uh, but during the regular season, really, that's our schools. And, and, and just keep in mind, there, there are not 350 Cherry Creeks. There are not. Okay? Cherry Creek could pay you that $13 now. Okay? They could. But I don't know about West Country. Okay? Not the same. So just, just kind of just understand the process and understand what's going on, understand what we're trying to do. Just know that we, we, we definitely appreciate all that you do. We know you're giving back. Just kind of keep that in, that, that is the spirit of what you do. And, and hopefully we can make it all work out. Thank you. Uh, we, we do. Uh, I think the pressure has to come from the, the top to go to people down in the capital to get their money. And that's not just for us. Janitor, teacher, and everybody else who needs the same pay rate to work on it. Complicated. That's all I have to say. <laughs> and, and that's real, but that's, but that's what we have to do in these right. So, um, any other questions of me? Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, guys. Thanks, Tom and for coming out and helping us out with that. Um, I hope that kind of cleared up the mic a little bit for everybody. Um, we're going to bring Jason now. Uh, talk about the schools and some places. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, I got to stand up on the microphone. Sorry.
First of all, are there any, in every group, in every side across the state, if you have people at your session, excuse me, that are new officials this year, would those new officials please stand up at each and every side? Doesn't look like we have any Denver, but for all of you that stood out, we welcome you to our group. We want you to be a part of our group, and the people that are sitting around you are willing to do what they can to make you successful in this new endeavor. So we appreciate your willingness to become part of our group, and we look forward to that friendship and that relationship long term. This year we don't have very much. But we do have. Something. Let's take just a second. I don't think we have the right one. Now we got the right one. So we don't have very many changes this year, but there are some things that the Federation wants us to discuss and present to uh, officials across the country. That's not my slide. <laughs> changes about the ball rule. There was a small error in the rule that said that described the description of the, of the, the surface of the ball. That's been changed where it now is a, has to be a deeply pebbled surface of the ball. It has, it, the ball will have a federation stamp on the panels. Those are the colors that will be affected in 2019-2020. That's exactly what's in the rule book today. So there's no change with that. The biggest change is this Nike Elite ball. That is not a legal basketball. So if you, if you have a game where they try to play with that Nike Elite ball, it's not legal and they have to provide another ball. The reason it's not legal is it's a dimple surface, not a double surface. So the feel is different. Nike knows it's not legal. Um, it is not legal this year. The backcourt rule. Not really any change, just a change in the interpretation. The previous interpretation was, on this particular slide that you see now, when the ball is tipped by a defender, last touch by a defender, when we've had team control in the front court, and the ball hit the floor in the backcourt, player from the offensive team could recover it without penalty because the defensive team was the last touch in the front court or went into the back court. Previously, the interpretation was, on the slide that you see now, is if the ball was last touched by a defender in the front court, but we had team control in the front court, and had not touched the floor in the back court, and was first touched by an offensive team, player when the ball was airborne, the Federation interpretation was that was backboard. That's been changed. Regardless of whether the ball touches the floor in the backboard or not, if the defending team was the last to touch it in the front court before it went into the backboard, the offensive team and or the defensive team can recover without penalty. Screening rule was clarified this year. Last year, remember, the rule was, was that when a player obtained a, a legal guarding position and maintained that legal guarding position, they couldn't be touching the floor in, out of bounds. 
It didn't say anything about screening. And so we're having to have both feet in bounds when setting a screen. It's been changed now. For a screen to be legal, the screener's feet must be, both feet must be in bounds. If a, if a player sets a screen and one foot is on the boundary line, as, as depicted in this slide, that's an illegal screen. And if there's illegal contact, the illegal contact will be charged on the screen. So those are the rule changes. Not many, not much significance as far as that goes. But there are some points of emphasis that we need to discuss. First one is about concussion. Concussion is a big thing. We need to protect ourselves as officials when it comes to concussion. People are getting better about concussion. Here's what we want to do. We want to make sure that we understand what the signs, symptoms, and behaviors of concussion are. Those are in, in the rules book in Rule 3, and they're in the appendix in the, in the back of the rule book. We need to be familiar with what those are. <laughs> Jim, can you find that lady? Thanks. <laughs> I didn't touch it. No, there's no light on it. Okay, we'll try that. All right, so we need to know what those are. We're not, we're not medical people. Unless you have an MD or a DO or you're a PA, don't try to do any medical stuff on the basketball floor. All right, we're not, we're not medical professionals, so we, we can't do that. All we need to do when we see those behaviors exhibited by a player is to report that to the coach. And say, Coach, player number 15 is exhibiting signs, symptoms, and behaviors of concussion. That, that player needs to be examined or checked out or whatever. Then it's up to the coach to determine whether or not that player can return or not. If the coach determines that that player can return and that player returns and shows those signs again, same protocol, same process. Continue to do that. You make any questions on that? We don't remove the player from the game. We just tell the coach that this player is exhibiting those and needs to be um, evaluated. Let's see, can somebody? Yeah, I have a question. So the topic coach is not um, any kind of a trainer or any qualified medical trainer? Trainer or not. Then the lists are MDs, DO, and PA. Statutorily, those are the people that can determine whether a player um, has a concussion or potential concussion or not. Athletic trainers are not defined as statutes. And I don't see Now it's blinking. What does that mean? Um, those are the only three that are allowed to determine whether a player can return to play. Um, if the coach brings it back, we're going to keep doing what we need to do as officials. Okay, we, need to, we need to be proactive in that and not react. Okay? Yes. According to my conversation with group this morning, that coach allows that player to return, then we continue to follow the process. And at some point, we have to say, Coach, this is not going to work. But, but according to the statute, the concussion statute, if you all remember, there was a kid who played professional football. Um, it died, so there was a statute um, 
that was passed into the legislature. Under that statute, a, a physician has to examine and release. Examine and release that, that player to what's called the concussion protocol. I don't know what that is, but that's the process before you convert. So, yes, we just do what the rule says we do. <laughs> None of the above. She's an EP, electronics <laughs> professional. How's that? The question was that if officials don't remove players, the coaches remove players, we just advise the coach of what we would observe. We just advise the coach of what we would observe and, and, and communicate to the coach that that player needs to be evaluated because they're, they are uh, exhibiting those signs, signs and symptoms of the age. I have a question, Dave. Yes. The question was if, if we see a player that definitely exhibits those signs um, that are listed, and the coach will bring that player back in the game when we as officials are not comfortable with that, how do we handle that? I think we handle it the same way. And we'll get some clarification and we'll get it out to everybody. First of all, in boys basketball, according to Bert, concussions are way down on the list, so they're not experienced as much in boys basketball as they are in girls basketball. So it's definitely more of an issue in the girls game statistically. Um, we'll find out exactly what the what Chaska wants us to do on those occasions when we see definitely that some player has uh, those signs and behaviors. But at this point, we just tell the coach what we've seen, what we've observed, and it's up to the coach to make that determination. Hey. Yes. I've got a book here, and I'm taking a look right now at 285. Right, the book says that the officials remove players. Chapter has made the decision that because of the statute in Colorado, that's not the official rule. That's the reason for that. The rule book says that the officials remove the players. Because of the statute in Colorado, Chasta's determination is that the officials advise what they've observed. And it's up to the coach. And, and the statute in Colorado goes way beyond high school basketball. It covers all youth sports. Okay? Does that clarify that thing? The question was the rule book says that the or the official group players, that's not the chance interpretation of the state statute in Colorado. Thank you. Enough on concussion show we want to blood. So we know that if a player has to be bleeding or has blood saturated on the uniform, that player must be removed from the game and that, that situation rectified before the player can return, unless, of course, what? They request a granted a timeout, and the, and the issue can be corrected within that timeout period. 
So we need to continue to be diligent in those in that blood rule as well. Uniform and apparel. Show of hands, who likes to get a uniform policeman? None. Didn't think so. But it's part of what we have to do. I can tell you that, that schools are doing a pretty good job of being proactive in that. We have probably received this year more than 30 questions regarding the uniforms before schools have purchased them to determine their legality or not. A majority of them were not legal. So those you won't have to deal with, they've already been dealt with. But it's our responsibility to make sure that we enforce properly um, the rules regarding uniforms. So once again, this year is a point of emphasis. It's the coach's responsibility to make sure that players are legally equipped and legally attired. It's also their responsibility to, to, to make sure that that starts in the warm-ups and goes through the entire contest. But it's our role to enforce the rule, and we'll do that as necessary. It's hard. And the reason that it's so hard is because the, the uniform market is so competitive. With the uniform market being so competitive, schools and players want to be like what they see on college. The Federation is doing a pretty good job of, of, of writing the rules. We just need to enforce them. If you have uniform issues, please let uh, your local interpreter know that's the East Lopez in the Denver area. That you have uniform issues, and they'll can pass those on to chess. So here's a couple of examples. The two, uh, picture A and B are legal. C is not legal because the other shirt has more than one manufacturer's logo. The resolution to that issue is that player can't play where you have the illegal under two. We have another issue here where we have different colored sleeves. Remember, all sleeves and knee pads are considered sleeves. Must be the same color, black, white, beige, or color uniform. Now, rules of review and areas of emphasis. Three that the Federation has identified this year. The family clip and traveling, legal guardian position, watch guard screen in Greater County, and lose all the country. Traveling is the hardest, I think, one of the hardest places that we have to, to make a decision on. Because the players are so much better now than they were last year or this year. So we need to know what legal move, what legal movement is and what legal movement isn't. We have to identify the pivot foot. When you're fishing, you start with the feet and work upwards so that you can identify the, the uh, pivot foot. If you know which foot is the pivot foot, you won't get caught in the trap by that last one that looks funny and must be illegal. If it looks funny and we don't know it's travel, like Mark said in his presentation, see what you call it, call what you see. We don't want to guess. Any coaches in the room? Coaches spend hours teaching players certain fundamental moves. If we as officials make mistakes and incorrectly rule on a legal play, when it rule an illegal when it's legal, that wastes all that coaches and players' time to run their practices. So we don't want to do that. Legal guarding position. We have to understand what legal guarding position is, what players can do once they, they obtain that initial legal guarding position. Two feet on the floor and bounce facing the opponent to obtain. Once, once the player obtains, they can move legally to maintain either laterally, obliquely, or backwards. Or they can jump vertically within their plane and just hold their arms in the air vertically. Time and distance for flying over regarding players without the ball, not players with the ball. If, when players are guarding a, a player with the ball, if we have multiple defenders and there's not three feet of space between those defenders, 
and the ball handler tries to get between those defenders, the responsibility for contact rests largely on the ball handler, providing the defenders maintain their legal guarding position. Same thing with the defender in a boundary line. And as I said before, time and distance are not factors in guarding the player with the ball, but are factors in guarding the player without the ball. Maximum of two steps. For guarding airborne players, a legal guarding position must be obtained before the player that we're guarding left the floor, whether they have the ball or not. And remember, by rule, a player in legal guarding position cannot be charged with a cop. Video is, is an important part of, of study to, um, to get better with that. Here's a player that's obtained an initial legal, legal guard position and now can move to maintain it laterally, obliquely, or backwards. Cannot be moving into the ball and or the player being guarded from contact with this. That is not legal maintaining the guard position. And this is a legal guard position by the player jumping or holding his or her arms in a legal plane. Any questions on legal guarding position? You gotta get better at legal guarding position. We have a tendency, I think, to penalize defenders when we shouldn't. Loose ball. How many of you in the game have heard the coach say, when we call the foul, they're just going for the ball? Everybody in the room should raise their hand. But that's not legal. And the Federation Rules Committee has found that loose ball recovery is becoming an issue because they've determined that it's a, it's, it's a free for all and it's been treated as a free for all. Incidental contact has come into play when we're dealing with loose balls. But remember, the incidental contact rule requires players to be equally in equally favorable positions. It doesn't allow for one player to dive for a loose ball and on top and you jump on and the opponent jump on top of them in an attempt to get a loose ball. We also know that if a player slides while gaining control while on the floor, that player can continue, can continue to slide without penalty because the momentum of that player started before they gained control of the ball. Doesn't how doesn't matter how far they slide. But once they've stopped, they can only sit up, which means they can only be on their back when they stop. They cannot roll over. Or they can start to roll over to their feet. Here's a, here's a, a depiction of a loose ball. And, and, and like the one point says, jumping or piling on during a loose ball situation is a foul. That is a foul. Sorry, I can't see your hand. The question was, if during the slide and the momentum causes them to roll, is that legal? That is legal because that's part of the slide. It's once they stop, once the slide stops, they have full control, but they cannot roll over. They can Started growing right to their feet. Any other questions? Sorry, I can't see you because of this light. Alright, so in summary, we need to review the pivot foot. We need to be better travel, travel officials. We don't want to be scare splitters, but we want to be better. We want to identify the pivot foot and, and penalize the only movement of the pivot foot. We want to understand legal guarding position. We need to seek out the fetters, identify the fetters. And identify that rule as legal or illegal. We need to make sure that we enforce the rule or rules regarding uniforms consistently across the board. It does no good for Kirby to enforce the rule one night and then the following night need not enforce the rule and has an inconsistency. Or vice versa, of course. If he doesn't enforce it and I do, then I'm a bad guy because they got to do it the night before. So we don't, we don't want to do that. So we want to make sure that we, we officiate the loose ball recovery situation in accordance with the rules and in accordance with contact. The last thing that we need to talk about is using proper terminology. And 
I've always done a really good job of that since I've been involved. We want to use the right words. We want to use the word, words that are written in the rule book when we're discussing situations with coaches. We don't want to fall into the trap of using terms that are not accurate and specific to the rule. That makes us more credible when we use those, those um, rule terms that are in the rule book. Here's a couple of examples. If we explain the, the rule to the coach in accordance with the rule book, the person that assigned you that game and Shasta can fully support you because you use terminology and you quoted the rule to the coach. That makes it easier for us when we do that rather than we try to use our own terminology in the, in the specific situations. Everything we do with coaches has to be professional. We have to maintain our professionalism throughout. Remember, the professional actions carry the day. Wearing the proper uniform and making sure we look professional. Appearance is, is, is 90% of the battle. If we look like we can do it, they think we can do it. If we don't look like we can do it, regardless of how good we are and how well we do it, our credibility is going to be So we want to make sure that we wear the uniform properly and it's properly maintained. Here's one that we didn't have to really worry about when a lot of us in this room started this year. Everywhere you go, everything you do, somebody's got a camera. So you need to maintain your professionalism in everything you do. Years ago, we could go to the, the local uh, pub or whatever after the game and discuss games. We used to do it as a group. We used to do it as a group. And, and have a couple of beers or whatever. We we got to be really careful with that anymore. Everywhere everywhere we go, we got to maintain our professionalism. Lastly, remember to find the, the game manager person. We don't want to be throwing fans out of games. We want the game management people to throw fans out of the games or deal with us sporting issues in the stands. We don't want to deal with that as, as game officials. So identify who that is and use them and have them deal with those situations. That's it for the, the, the rules presentation. Just a couple of um, housekeeping things. Remember, each area has an area of interpreter. That person is the, is the first point of contact when you have rules questions or interpretation questions. Then we have a mechanism by which, by which we, we disseminate all of those questions and interpretations to all the interpreters across the state. So we all have consistency and message and that we're doing things the same way. So that said, I wish you all a, a really good season. If you have rules, suggestions for changes, let your local interpreter know and have a process to do that also. That said, are there any questions on anything that we've talked about today? See you then. Thanks very much. Have a good day. Is there a question I can say?
what you most want to make on the court from the coaches and an AD view. So, Kevin Bowling, Glenn and Ice Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, truthfully, you know, as I was thinking about today, um, our, our softball team just won the state championship. We have to back to back. And it's the first two championships in the world in history. And then, so, in about two weeks, I'm going to be doing a state championship assembly. I'm going to be in front of about 3,000 people. And it probably won't feel the same as being in front of you right now. Um, you know, I talk to Rudy Robinson all the time. Rudy says, you know, Kevin, you're the nicest guy in the world for a lot of So, some people would say, I'm just like that all the time. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, kind of walking in, I'm exactly sure what I can bring to this, what I can offer. Um, as John mentioned, I'm an athletic director of Western High School. I don't know that there's any other boys basketball big school. AD coaches, this was a unique opportunity, and I think that stems from the fact that I opened it 11 years ago. Um, I'm the boys' basketball coach there. I'm also the assistant principal. Um, I'm also the basketball star for the Continental League. I also have a son who's a basketball player at the end. And so I think one of the unique things about me is that I can look at this from a lot of different lenses, and I think that helps. Um, I was the athletic director and hired a volleyball coach who didn't play my daughter. And I had to do crowd control and model what I want for all parents all the time without getting involved. And then what's going to upset now ex wife how to deal with a frustrated daughter, having to try to coach up the coach that wasn't playing my daughter, and trying to model for everybody what that's look like. And it's a challenge. Um, as I walked in and I was listening today, I was reflecting back. When I was um, first starting to get into coaching, so way back in the day, I was actually a college baseball player at the University of Texas, and a lot of the umpires that sat behind the bases in shape of market, guys like that, they were the first um, basketball officials that I had the opportunity to kind of watch work. And so it was a unique relationship going from sitting right behind me as a catcher and then those games. And when I was in college, I had the opportunity to be an assistant basketball coach at Littleton High School. And so back in the day when Littleton was good, um, I was a coach. Um, we actually won a couple of state championships. We beat Manuel, Rudy Carey, Rangers, and Terry Taylor. And so when I was a young coach, I had the opportunity to really watch some some special coaches and can be around some um, really neat situations. And then I was fortunate when I was 22, I was hired at Jefferson High School in Edgewater to go get a head basketball coach there. So I spent three years at an inner city school, um, which was an unbelievable opportunity. Three years to try to learn how to do this. I had no parent problems at that time. I'm a reluctant parent, actually, came to the gym. Kind of did all so it's funny, I was a couple of circles of three years there, and then I was, uh, I'm not going to say fortunate enough, but I would say happiness to be with Montrose in my group of years. But I spent five years on the Western Slope um, in Southwestern League in Montrose. That was quite an experience. Um, the officials over on the Western Slope were very different than they are on this side. The, the kind of basketball that's played there was very different. And then I was fortunate, uh, dream job was to go to Bloomfield High School. And I was there for nine years. And um, seven, three days, five final fours, two, two state finals, state championships. Got worked that game. We got all of us got special places in our life. One state championship, we worked that game. Um, you know, in that same game, there's a, a great picture of me and uh, Rudy, not Rudy, um, Rodney. And I'm standing there, it looks like I'm screaming at him, and I'm really not. Um, but everybody thinks that you know, I was screaming at him in that game. Um, but that game went really well. I remember the youngest guys in the world. So, and then 12 years ago, I was fortunate enough to uh, open Legend High School. And I went as a PE teacher and um, first department chair and ran our weight room. And we opened up with a question on. Study with that experience is going from coaching an elite team to freshmen only um, was really humbling. A 
how we do the recruiting. But what I said about that time was that only in high school was the best thing I ever did, it was the hardest thing I ever did, and it was both of those every single day. And if you know anything about that, that experience, um, that first group of kids was pretty special, and culminated by Derek White was in that group. And if you don't know Derek White was the first round draft pick in the San Antonio Spurs. And if you read any of his games, he was like five foot ten and hundred pounds maybe. And we called him the group of baby child. Um, you can see he was special, but at that time he didn't look like a computer NBA player. Um, but that first experience, that first senior class, and then our second senior class got in the final four. So we're the only school in history to go from three A to five A, and we were the fastest school to get to the final four um, in history. And so that was really a special opportunity for me. Um, five years ago, I had a chance to become the athletic director, and so now I, I wear a lot of different hats. And so in terms of today, what I was hoping was one to just kind of you know, talk about the issues that I, I see in that way, correct, as a basketball coach. Um, try to share what I think is most important. I certainly am not trying to come in here and be critical in any way. I hope that I can offer a perspective. I'm certainly open to answering any questions. I hope you would be brutally honest. I'm try to, you know, be brutally honest, um, you know, with you as well. Um, I think the biggest thing that concerns me right now as a coach and as an athletic director, I see is the breakdown of the, of the fan. And it really impacts us. And I was thinking about how my lens as a white suburban, upper middle class, rich school, and a community might be very different than an urban school or an inner city school. You know, but I think the issues are the same, they're just different, if that makes sense. But what I think about is when I was growing up, you know, families, went to church, families ate dinner together, families talked about their days, and kids got some semblance of right and wrong and values. And I'm not sure that that takes place anymore. I think we've lost priorities. I think that um, families are way too invested in wrong things. 3% of high school athletes go on to public college, and you have families investing the same amount of money in club teams, private trainers, and all this, this other stuff, and they're not worrying about grades, they're not worrying about Julie, they're not worrying about social media, they're not worrying about um, suicide and things like that. <laughs> sure. We'll see what happens. Here. So, so I, I think what happens is um, there's a significant amount of pressure on teachers, coaches, schools. Um, that make everything we all do really challenging. Um, the impact on club sports, I, I'm concerned as an athletic director 10 years from now, 15 years from now, we won't have high school sports. Um, the truth is, the reason Legend won the state softball state championship is our club girls play at Legend High School. And you see this now where, um, especially with soccer, they don't even play at high school anymore. It's not important to work. You look at their Twitter page, it'll say what their club is, it does the same thing about their high school. And you know, the impact of that is when they get to us is that parents are paying and it's hard. And when I think about your role and I think about my son, you know, my son's been playing gold rounds, playing hawks, and whatever. And so every Saturday or Sunday for the last six, seven, eight years, we go playing games. And you know, parents spend a lot of time and money and they follow their kids around and they think there's some kind of investment to be made at the end. But I watch how they act at games and how they yell at officials, how they yell at coaches. And we live in this world of sports talk radio where we all have the answers to everything and everybody's critical. And, and it's just, it's a challenging situation. Um, what we're dealing with with kids in terms of drugs and Julie, and, and suicide and things like that, safety in schools, it's like nothing um, that we grow with. And so it's just a crazy dynamic. So what I'm trying to tell you is that there's a lot of dynamics going on. I tell our coaches all the time, coaches and missionaries. Billy Graham says that a coach will impact more people in one year than most people are life. And they need us, whether that's you know a kid at Legend High School, whether that's a kid at Aurora Central, 
they need the coaches and teachers. And when I think about sports and activities and the impact that it plays on the success of kids keeping them involved in schools, um, it's a really important piece. And in terms of basketball, I think it's a great game. When I was talking to coaches about what I wanted to say, I can tell you that every coach I spoke to wanted me to communicate how much we appreciate you and how hard we recognize that you work, what a challenge it is to be an official, to be with our parents and stands, to be with the way that you get back, and all those things. And as a basketball star, I'm aware of the shortage and, and it's concerning and, and frustrating and, and challenging. And again, I just want to convey to you how much coaches may be truly appreciate you. I'm not sure that I was come across. I'm not sure that I was feels that way. Now, having said that, um, George is my best friend. I said, Joe, what do you want me to communicate? I said, the first thing I need you to tell them is that this shit is really important to us as coaches. <laughs> this is our job. And when we don't win, we deal with parents and we deal with attitudes and things like that. Now, I'm coming from the lens of the Continental League and the Centennial League, some of the best coaches. You know, I've been fortunate to work with Ken Shaw, Tim Keith, and Bob Wood, and Tim Grant, and that on a regular basis. You know, so when I'm talking, that's my lens. Okay? And with you know, these guys, this is really, really important. And the truth is, as coaches, we find our identity in the success of our teams. And so, in other words, when we're winning, we feel really good. When we're not winning, we feel really bad. And I can give you an example. Um, our softball team started one seven this year, and our coach was on death on nine. And I remember talking to her like, it's where you finish the season. Don't worry about it now. Just keep doing what you do. Well, 17 wins later, they're state champions. And it's an interesting commentary on, you know, when you have adversity, there's two rows to go. You go this way, you feel sorry for yourself, and get negative, or you keep grinding. Okay? And so, again, back to Joe's thing, this is what we do. And you know, I'll give you an example. Like, we're spending time open gyms and skill development and weight room and fall leagues and spring leagues and summer leagues. And I figured it out. Coaches get paid about five cents an hour to make it. And so they're doing it. Most of us are doing it about, about the goodness of our hearts and making a difference in the lives of and so, you know, as coaches, like I said, this is really, really important to us. Um, and again, that element of dealing with parents is an ongoing thing for us and it makes it really hard, which leads me to probably the most important thing. If there was one thing we talked about today, it would be communication. And as the athletic director, my job most of the time is to listen. And I can't tell you. Adults are the absolute worst. It's unbelievable what teachers and coaches and parents and we all think we communicate well, and we don't. And, and it's really, you know, it's a frustrating thing. So in terms of communication, this, this was a common thing with all the coaches. Communicate. And we start the game with a pre-game, we talk about sportsmanship, and then we talk about you let's communicate. And I know that some of the dynamics of how we do things, um, you want to call rotate away, things like that, make it really hard. If we talk about communicating and then we don't communicate. We talk about communicating, we don't listen. We talk about communicating and that just doesn't consistently happen a lot of times. And so example theory, there's a foul call, you rotate away. Well, don't yell at me across the room, across the floor. I get that. Let's talk about it when I rotate around. Five plays later, you don't want to talk about those five plays ago. This is the first time you've made it around to talk about it. You know, that's a frustration for a coach. And again, I think that's a dynamic in your systems, you know, but that's a frustration. I can tell you there's a lot of times where a coach just needs to be heard. I can think of an example um, where I was really frustrated. That doesn't happen very often. So, um, but I'm upset with an official over here. Well, if this official here will listen to me, he will diffuse the situation. You know, if he's willing to take it, maybe. And I'm thinking of an example. Um, 
you know, I was really upset with some of the Johnny Martinez, but this is for a long time. And he took a while. You know, John will be one of the best at, you know, it's not his call, but he'll listen. Versus, you get defensive, or you don't want to hear it, or you're like, it's not my call, or you want to come over and talk to the coach. You know, those, those are kind of things on that communication piece. Um, you know, there's a, you know, I made a comment here about arrogance versus defensiveness versus willingness. You know, sometimes, and I get it, um, you know, I, I, I was thinking about a coach, the, the guy that replaced me at Bloomfield, Terrence. Terrence chews a lot. He grinds a lot. And the truth is he does that because he might not know exactly what to do. When you're a younger coach and you don't know what to do, sometimes you just start chewing. Some coaches will recognize you know, that this is the situation. I know, usually, when I can get on and when I need to step back. I remember um, Ron was the worst. He just yelled and chewed and grinded. And I remember Ron said once, I'm done. I'm done. I can't talk anymore. He's not listening. You know, veteran coaches know that, but not every coach knows that. And so I think you got to understand like, where that's coming from. And then I can tell you that certain coaches feel like certain coaches get away with a lot, and certain coaches don't get away with very much. And so is there a consistency in how we treat coaches and what we allow and things like that? So that was a common thing um, you know, that kind of came out. Um, points of emphasis. This was another thing that, that came out as I asked coaches what you want to talk about. I know you were talking about what's most important points of emphasis. It's always going to be hand check, it's always going to be physical play, things like that. What does it look like the first part of the season and the end of the season? Is it going to be called consistently or is it going to change? And the other thing is if I go down and play Dory and Carl Springs, does it look the same in Colorado Springs as it does in Denver? Or if we go to Fort Collins to play Fossil Ridge, the Northern Ridge is probably the same way. And I will tell you that it looks completely different. It looks completely different. And I can tell you that when we're in the Springs, there's going to be a lot more travel calls than when we're in Denver. It's just, just the way it is. You know, that's going to be. Um, I can tell you that as a coach, Colorado is the only place that calls the Springs. We go to LA and it's a rugby match, and they're looking at us like, what the point? You know, and, and here, you know, as coaches, you're trying to get your kids to do certain things, and, and then you, they're getting punished for that. But I, I'm just, you know, those kinds of things, like, we're worried about it. This, this is funny. So, people like, uh, who's my JV coach, Bruce, says, um, we really need to worry about all the shorts, and then we kill each other, you know, in the post, or we call every illegal screen call. Or whatever, like what's really most important in terms of you know, the impact of the game. Um, so just some thoughts on that. Um, the impact of a missed call. This was something that um, we talked about a lot. So we have a play coming down the floor, and it's a no call here, and then it goes down the other. And it's a similar play, and it's an and one. Well, that's a five, six point swing. But if you're in a really close game, that, that can really impact something. And, you know, so those missed calls or, you know, something where, you know, where somebody's got somebody play through contact, somebody else isn't, you know, those kind of things over time will have an impact on the basketball game. Um, again, back to Terrence. Terrence talked about positive interactions with coaches, diffusing situations instead of provoking. So I think that's the thing. So you're going to have those plays in the course of the game. You know, again, is it, is it wisdom? Is it game management? Is it um, diffusing a situation? Is it escalating a situation? I know that the way that, that we uh, rank games and so forth, oftentimes with three, there might be a veteran official, there might be a younger official, things like that. Um, how does that work in terms of you help each other, you cover for each other, do you um, – you know, work together as an older partner, maybe take the heat for a younger guy or, or that guy. Um, those are those are all just important things um, that I think you know are good to understand. Um, other things. So 
We play in spring leagues, we play in fall leagues, we play in summer leagues. Here's what I would say. I get that we're not getting paid very much to work those things. Um, I get that parents are out of control. I get that the kids. One of the things that's happened is the NBA has impacted us in high school in a strange way. And so, actually, a couple. So, what we've seen in the last 10 years is that all these club teams will show up at a particular high school. Okay, smoking over for example. Okay, or shop for for example. Well, why did that start to happen? Because LeBron James and Wayne Bosch and or Dwayne Wade and Bruce Bosch decided to take their accounts to Miami. Well, kids see that. So, it impacts high school. What do you see in the NBA now? Players complain every single call. Well, now kids see that. They think that's what's happening. And when they go to club and you know all that kind of stuff, they think it's okay to complain all the time. Well, that's a dynamic. So here's what I've said. Kids are kids. And ultimately, this is about kids. Um, but when we're doing non-regular games, spring and summer games, what does that look like? So what I saw in the last year is it's almost become much more adversarial in the offseason. Don't want to hear it. Not take it. Um, almost creating more hostile environments, things like that. Um, and so that's a concern. Um, that's a concern on our end. Um, I think that's a concern on your end, things like that. There's a dynamic there that I think we have to address. So um, those are kind of my thoughts. Um, do we have some questions, things that I can, can answer? I have a Go ahead. Okay. So on your last comment, are you are you saying that during the summer and the spring and fall leagues, you feel that we should allow the players to act that way? Because in, in my opinion, if we allow them to do it there, and when we get to the regular season, they're so accustomed to doing it now that that's so I apologize for not being very clear. I thought it would keep great from the bad. Between the officials and the players? And parents. So what, what would you think would be a solution? Because if we let them do that in the off season, then they're more likely to continue to do that all of the time. So, um, <laughs> so the question, so, so my comment was about spring and fall, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and players' behavior, parents' behavior, things like that. My answer would be is get the coaches involved. So what I would say is that if kids are talking, let your coach know early and often. And instead of engaging with players or engaging with the parents, you get the coach involved early and try and head off that way. What I what I saw is that we're almost picking and it's creating a dynamic, a dynamic, a dynamic if that makes sense. Okay, so you're saying that officials are not actually addressing the school as far as like assessing the time of the foul, for instance, if you're in the set, bantering back and forth with the That's what I have seen out of the world. And I guess what I'm trying to say is players are worse, parents are worse. So I get it. Um, what I guess what I'm really saying is ask help with the coach. First, early. And if the coach doesn't, and, and there's some fault, well, I get it. You know, then you can do that. But I, I, I guess what I'm saying is instead of initiating that kind of thing, go to the coach right away and say, hey, your boy is he's, he's chipping too much. Or, you know, let's just come to a meeting. Like, you know, I'm thinking of Chaparelli, where you're all working, it's the same guys working the same games all the time. Let's talk to Paul and say, Kevin, Cam's a pain in the ass. Let's get him under control right away. Stuff like that. Um, use your game managers, whatever, to get this parent right here um, instead of engaging them, which is just going to escalate things. If that makes sense. Yeah. <coughs> Coach, first, thanks for coming. And sharing your thoughts. Uh, so, for us, I'm a part of the game. Every year, communication. My question is, as it relates to what coaches expect for communication, 
Is it a certain number of times, or every time you want to talk, you want to answer? What What's the coach's specific expectation? I don't know. I know mean, you're not going to be able to say five, five times. But we all know we have coaches that come at a lot of play. And we, and we got to keep getting going. We can't communicate everything. What, can you expand on that a little bit? Since you guys have actually played baseball, I think that it's really good to be able to do that. So, um, I think it's so I'm, yeah, yeah. So, so the question is back about communication. Um, I recognize dealing with Rudy Carey is different than dealing with, you know, somebody else. Dealing with Bob Wood is different than dealing with um, somebody else. I realize there's dynamics there. Um, what I would say is, when an official doesn't acknowledge something, they're just probably going to create something. And I don't think you should be talking every play, you know, but a, a tap on the leg saying, I hear you, okay, or we'll watch it, or something like that will diffuse it rather than ignoring it or debating it. Does that make sense? And again, I think this is where a partner can come in. And, and again, I'm thinking of, you know, Sandy's working with John, I'm mad at Sandy. You know, John's right in front of me, and she takes that, um, that will diffuse it. It's when a coach gets ignored, or when a coach is told, not my call, or personal favorites, wait till they rotate around here and talk about it, which is 10 plays later, then we're told, Coach, that was 10 plays ago, I'm not talking about him. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, I think there's some gamesmanship that comes along with that, um, that, that some get. And, and some, to be blunt, you've never heard some talking about. You know, not, I've never made that play call or anything, so I get it. You know, but, you know, sometimes you say, yeah, man, I missed it. Even if you didn't, we'll go a long way. Now, some of this is just out of control and reason. I get it. I would not want to work with Bob Wood. I would not. You know, I wouldn't want to work some other games. Um, I get that. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that most of us, like I said, will become reasonable and will calm down with just some of those things. Does that make sense? Saying right or wrong, I'm saying 
Coaches get frustrated when we worry about things that don't seem to matter, and then we don't worry about the things that do. Enough. 
Um, we don't want keys, and I don't think you guys want to get keys. So forth. Because now that's going to escalate. Um, so I think that, that it, it's a tag team, you know. And maybe again, like when I say coach, some coaches have skill to do that. Like I, I think I know when it's time to stop. You know? um, others don't. Terrence doesn't. Terrence doesn't know when it's time. Uh, and so maybe somebody's got to snuggle in and just be like, bro, you know, something like that. And maybe we're doing it, and it's not working. I don't know the answer to that. I, I think that, like, what I watch is there's a frustrated coach, and I want to talk to an official, and it's still snuggling up with me. He's going over here and getting away. You know, give me this. You know, and now I'm getting, you know, now I'm getting hot. You know, something like that. And if you're young and you don't know how to do things, you can start yelling and things like that. So I don't know if that answers the question. You mentioned uh, the impacting the game. I want to call that impacting the game. So we come to the coaching and say, coaches can do to fix this. Your choice not to, that impact the game because it's your star player that's best it out. Don't you have the power to impact the game by making sure that he is legally proper? So this, this won't sound like a very good answer. Um, <laughs> kids are a pain. Um, you know, I think about my own kid. I ask him to do something, he'll do it, and then he goes right back to the way he wants. And they'll do it initially and then um, whatever. Um, I, I'm not saying I'm, I'm right on this. I'm just saying I want to talk to you about handshakes and half court versus beating the heck out of our post. I don't want to talk about shorts. You know what I'm saying? But the answer is yes. Like, if this is an issue, I said, come to code, just, it would take like a long time to sub the cam out of the shorts. And I'm going to chew in, and, and I think it's going to be clean up. If that makes sense. But, but do it early. You know, um, I, I guess that would be something to give. What's really frustrating is when there's something like that that comes late in the game when it could have been addressed early in the game. You know, that makes sense. And I get it, I think it's human nature, like, we're, we're right on each other. I'll give you examples in AD. Like, I'm, I'm sitting in our club, you know, up stands, up butter, but in a press box area. I didn't. Parents are idiots. I'm sorry. And I'm wrong. You know, we say the dumbest things. And I guess we think because, you know, Monday night countdown or whatever, you know, you think about it. And you know, every dad played baseball for a so he thinks he knows everything about baseball. You know, and, and whatever, we just say don't think we're emotional. And the truth is, um, you know, our kids have seen the most important things in our lives, and so we do get emotional about that. Um, I, I guess, to, to be honest, I forgot where I was going for that. Um, so I apologize, I forgot, I forgot my train of thought about that. Um, so we're talking about shorts, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I know. So it's talk about. Okay, so like I'm sitting there, and it's like, where, where's that line that they cross where I finally address what they're saying versus I put nothing, just because it's it's ignorant. You know, so I get it. Like you're you're tolerating things in games because it's right on the edge. We haven't quite crossed the line. It was something like that, and then maybe in the fourth quarter, do we do it? Um, I guess what I would say is it's something like that. They were the first quarter. You know, and if you wait until the fourth quarter and ask the game, you know, you're, you're going to have some frustrations. So hopefully that makes sense. Kevin, is your perspective the coach that you questions here? One is that play pressure. When you see your other coaches acting like a fool on the sidelines, let's just say, we'll use turn for you, but on. As an athletic director, do you, because what I see is that that escalates, when Terrence escalates, the crowd escalates, because they think he knows what he's talking about all the time. And just my, our opinion from this side of the room, coaches don't always know what they're talking about. Because as an athletic director, can you address that, or how can we get athletic directors across the state to address that coach that to, to tell them that it's their actions that affect the game as a 
whole because that brings in the crowd. So let me ask you about saying this. First off, you talk about home fields for the Lord. I'm just using, I don't want to pick on you. I don't know. We were out of control, and you know, once we got that invitation to try out, and I said, um, maybe I'll we'll do this. Um, here, here's what I said. I think that we're living in a different world. Um, I think things have changed, and I think we have to address this. So, what I would tell you is if a legend coach was acting a certain way, I would want you to reach out to me. And I, you know, back to my different roles. Because um, I am a coach, just because I'm a dad, all that stuff, I think I can see it differently. An example for you every soccer coach hates soccer coaches. And it's amazing to me, like on the soccer game, we play about 78 minutes, 0 0. And now we've got a rush on that, and there's some contact, and everybody wants to call because there's been no goals in the game, and can't breathe. You know? And so um, I'm always talking to my coaches. Now, I don't know that every AD will speak to their coach, but I would say this. If you are consistent with dealing with coaches, reach out to that AD and just say, you have a problem with this guy, or whatever, can you help us? And you know, if you're not, if it's a continental new guy, reach out to me, and, and I would be in that conversation. Um, I think that we have to probably do more of that kind of stuff. Um, and Lemonade, like I said, we have an official shortage you know, we have issues. We're dealing with tons of issues as babies and coaches about parenting and kids and things like that. We got to figure out how to work together so that we're not moving to the so that we're not having some of these problems. And you know, maybe we got to look at it differently. And, and I don't know how many officials do reach out to the uh, ADs. Uh, and the truth is, if you reach out to an AD about a, a basketball coach in particular and you get no response or you get a negative response or they ignore it, if you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to have that conversation with an AD and be like, hey, look, we need some help. Um, I don't know if we're changing, but it's better than more. So, part two. If, if hey, we, Jeff, we got to move on. We, we got to, I'm sorry. I mean, uh, we, we got other people that are waiting to, to talk, and Dave Smith wants to say one more thing. So, sorry. We, we don't like to do that, so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring him back next year for now. If you go to my last thing, whatever, um, if you've got questions, I, I can tell you that I think what makes this cheap is I'm an athletic director now. There's not very many of those. And I'll tell you, I think my AD role is incredibly serious. Um, probably put basketball in the background. If you want to have a further conversation or you want to email me or you, know, you want to tweet me or Instagram me or, or Facebook me or whatever the case may be, 20 percent I'm happy to have that conversation. And if I said something that was either you know concerning or offensive or unclear, and you want to have that follow up, I'm happy to have that conversation. Um, you know, I guess about like what Joe said, this shit's important to us. And you know, we want to be good, and I want to be in basketball. I want part of basketball to be um, great. And so if I can help, I'm happy to do that. Um, I don't know that I can, but, but I'm happy. So, that being said. Thank you. I just wanted to make one comment or a couple of comments about Kevin, and I think it's a correlation with what his career has been and, and officiating. Kevin said that when he was catching for Regents University, I umpired a number of games. We always talked. Umpires, home plate umpires, and catchers talk all the time. We didn't talk much baseball, we talked a lot of basketball. Um, but he was interested in being a coach when he graduated. Well, at that time, I knew the district athletic director for Jefferson County. And I, caught, I called him and I said, Do you have any basketball leagues? And he said, Yeah, I got one. I'm going to Jefferson. He said, Nobody wants to go to Jefferson. Kevin said he took that opportunity. All he got was an opportunity, and he got an opportunity to ref one of the worst games in, the, in town. When you look at it from an officiating standpoint, but he took that opportunity and he, and he built a plot. And he got to the position where he's at today, where he's one of the most respected and prestigious coaches in the state. And that can happen to officials too. All you can ask for is an opportunity, but when you get that opportunity, you got to take advantage of it. So I just wanted to make that comment that he, 
he got an opportunity and he took advantage of it, and we can do the same to the So I applaud you for that, and congratulations, I got you this job. All right, first we're going to bring out we're going to bring Jim Beers and from Steamboat. And we're going to hopefully this goes out first. So we're going to talk about improvement and engagement. Thank you. There we are. Well, welcome to Moffat County High School in Craig, Colorado. Uh, I'm Jim Beers, head of the Recruitment and Retention uh, Committee. Um, living in Steamboat these days. We're hearing me okay? Yeah. Perfect. We'll continue on then. Uh, first of all, let me introduce the committee members. Uh, Jeff Hansen from Golden. John Wyatt from Colorado Springs, Willie Rodriguez from Pueblo, Brian Wong from the Fort Collins Loveland area, Ryan Baderas from Greeley. Ryan has stepped in to take over for Jerry Brink. Jerry was on the committee for the first couple of meetings, but had to step away due to family considerations. Bill Beasley in Eagle, and Steve Williamson and Scott Parsons in Longmont. Now these are folks that you can connect with to uh, share your ideas about recruiting or retention of officials. You can ask questions of them and myself. You can also make comments regarding anything about recruiting and retention. Uh, if there is not a person in your area in Eastern Colorado and Southwestern Colorado are not represented, feel free to contact me, Jim Beers, ref, R-E-F, at Comcast.net. Our committees had two conference calls so far. We meet quarterly or more frequently as needed. Our next conference call is set for early to mid-January. One of the first items we talked about is recruiting versus retention. And we came to the decision that they really are two separate issues. So we have formed a retention subcommittee that will be headed up by Jeff Hansen and will include a couple uh, committee members uh, on this subcommittee as well. They'll focus specifically on retention related issues. They'll propose solutions to those issues and then report back to the full committee, onto the executive committee of Colorado Board 4, and ultimately back to you, the members of Colorado Board 4. One of our draft goals is to increase, increase retention in Colorado. Um, there is a startling statistic that is out there that I mentioned last year during the master clinic. The uh, National Federation of State High School Association surveys show that only two out of every 10 officials return for their third year of officiating. Two out of 10. We really must do better than that. Other areas that we've talked about with recruiting and retention is the mentor-mentee efforts, uh, making suggestions, finding the best practices, if you will, and applying them across Colorado. Um, better coordination with our assigners to encourage more multi-sport officials. This may be more of a longer term goal that we're looking at, but if you take a look at the number of registered officials in all sports in Colorado in the year 2015-16, showed about 4,600 officials in all sports, yet only about 800 of those officials are multiple sport officials, only about 18%. So we think that there's some growth opportunities there if we are able to tap in better with multi-sport officials. We're talking about also easy ideas too, the development, this is a Bill Beasley idea, a development of business cards that are quick and easy that we can hand out to interested parties um, that would have basic information with a website or a hashtag, become an official, um, then customize it uh, for your local contact information, whatever area you might be in, We'll design it, we'll pay for it. If you have an interest, let us know. Um, one thing that we're working on diligently right now is to contact coaches, coaches like Kevin Boley, who get it, what it takes to be an official, because Kevin is a high level coach as well. So thank you to Kevin for his comments as well. What we're talking about though with officials is we want to appeal directly to officials to encourage their players 
a vast majority of them will not play after high school. They're done after high school. But they've played for a number of years. They love the game. Maybe they would like to pick up and referee the game as well. We will appeal to coaches on a couple of different levels, career and community development for their former players, plus staying close to the game they love, being able to make a few bucks along the way. Um, we have some common language and some talking points that we've developed as a committee. We will share that common language uh, with committee, uh, with rules interpreters, and if necessary, area directors, so that can be presented to coaches during their breakout league breakout meetings, uh, rule meetings, uh, similar activities, parent meetings, whatever it might be. Um, we also intend to distribute this information through CHASA. That might carry a little bit more weight if it has uh, CHASA's cachet on it, plus also uh, the Colorado High School Coaches Association group and the Colorado Athletic Directors group all common information. This letter really does talk about the fact that if it hasn't hit you yet, these talking points rather, if it hasn't hit you yet, it will. Rescheduling of games is inevitable because of a lack of officials. Um, cancellation of lower level games could be happening because of a lack of officials. Um, so again, we'll, we'll, we're a growing state and every time a new school opens in the state, it means boys and girls an additional 48 varsity games a year, sub varsity, JV at 38, and if there's a C-level team, another 38 games. That taxes an already declining number of officials in the state. So you can see we really do need to tap into coaches to have them see and buy off on that as much as possible to try to help their former players, uh, as they become former players, transition into that, become officials as well. So these are just a few ideas, initiatives that we're talking about, that we're working on. Some are more short term, some are longer term. But you know, there's some good information out there. We're working hard as a committee. We would welcome your ideas and welcome uh, any sort of feedback that you might have. The individuals that I mentioned that are part of the committee, Feel free to touch base with them. Some may be in your particular association. If not, feel free to reach out to me and we'll coordinate that. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Now we have the rule book. We have rule, there's 10 rules. Now we have 11. Right here is the last page. So I think it's a rule that in the third week in January, that we, we are going to fight the cause of cancer. My son sitting out there, I uh, lost my wife 17 years ago, so I believe in fighting and giving and bringing awareness. And we, I think, are very fortunate in the world of basketball to have this campaign uh, of Fishers versus Cancer. So as a leader, uh, and Paul McCluskey and I developed this letter, and all of you received it in your rule packet. So I'm not going to do any reading for you. I just want to hit a couple of highlights. And one of the issues, or one of the things that I hope I challenge you with today and all across the state on the, on the website today is that you think about it and that, that we do wear a pink whistle. I will get you one if you do not have one or any of those areas need them. All of that will make sure that you have all the new officials. We already have officials for them. And the, this is year 11 of this campaign. And uh, there's 17,000 officials. We're 1,000 in Colorado. And we just want to have you get the passion and have an inner passion and have it be contagious. contagious. Uh, we used to ask for a game check. Uh, maybe that's too much now. 
Just ask them to get your friends involved. If you've got 10 friends, and they gave ten dollars. That's a hundred dollars, and you multiply that times a thousand. It's very simple. It's not everybody's campaign. I understand that, but we've all been touched some way. So I challenge us all to become a giver and bring awareness. And Chasa gives us elasticity during that week to wear pink. There's pink basketballs, kids are wearing pink jerseys, we're wearing pink and white stripes, pink bands, pink whistles, pink socks. Uh, there's a school down in the, in the rural part of uh, eastern Colorado that their whole school is involved for that basketball game for that one day. So there's a lot of creative things. There's corporate America. A lot of you work in corporate America. You can help us to bring awareness. Take a bucket, sit it on the desk. Take a bucket, take it to the game. Uh, Tom Caracato is here today, and he was in the, in, involved in one Colorado Springs, and we had a newspaper guy come in the locker room and said, what are you guys doing? Get a TV, get a radio station. There's a lot of creative things. So, if you have a heart and cancer touched you, I just hope that you, during that week, will come on board and uh, influence your friends in an infectious, contagious way to say, tell your story. Tell about one of your friends. We've lost three guys in Colorado Springs in the last couple of years that were on the court. It's sad, it's heart wrenching, but we're going to fight. We're going to fight. We're going to fight. Thank you very much. We got to go. uh, we're, we're ready for the uh, Amanda from the uh, American Cancer Society to show up. She's going to be here right at the board. Uh, so just to talk for about 15 minutes. And then when Amanda is here, we'll, we'll, we'll call it. There's a, a box right back here on this common thing. That's where your uh, attendance card is. What do you want to talk about? Questions, comments, concerns? Lisa Stone, because this is going all over the state, so I want to make sure everybody knows this year. Has a question: the, Why do we call things different across the state, and why do they call things different? In, as Kevin fully stated, in California, why is there different points of emphasis in public in different areas of our country? When we all have the same book, is that correct? Is that my my great interpretation? Uh, as a coordinator official myself, I think we call the the, the rules as written. I think that is our best defense to you know when when you've got to go answer to Kevin Bowie, he, he stands up behind you and. You know, I'm, I'm a fairly large man myself. It makes me feel small. And uh, you say, Coach, as written, the, the rule is this. We need to know our rules. We need to know how to apply those rules. Are we going to get every rule right? No. Am I going to see things different than Lisa Stone? More than likely. Um, my, my take to the state of Colorado would be, if we can put ourselves in the best position to see the play, process the play, and react to the play as, as quick as possible, as a high school basketball official, we're going to get more plays right than we're going to get wrong. The number one is we have to put ourselves in the right position. Is the book always right? Probably not. You know, the 
mechanics manual tells us we need to stand here at this point, we need to stand here when the ball goes to this point. To me, you have to do what works for you. And if you're not getting plays right and you're going, number one is you got to go back and watch tape on yourself and the game you, you had, if possible. And coaches are getting better about getting this little, the, that video. Um, and all you got to do is ask, either before the game or after the game, even after the game. A losing coach, they might tell you, well, you blew this call, this call, this call, this is where it's at. I'll take that criticism as long as I can get that take. A couple years ago, I got evaluated at the state tournament. And, uh, and oh, sorry for the, those out there in uh, the internet. The question is, what's, why is there a difference across, across the state? From Greeley to Carl Springs to Denver to the Western Slope. My response is, is when I was able to go to the state tournament, those of us that love this game, we go to the state tournament, we watch. And that's an opportunity to see 150 officials amongst four different locations from all across the state. In those three days that I evaluated the state tournament, I can tell you, without knowing the person that's on the floor, where they were from. By whether it was mechanics, their interpretation of the rules, or whatever it is, you can tell. I don't know why it's different. I don't know how we change it. I would love to tell you that we can change it by a statewide camp or whatever it would be that you know, I hear things in, in Wyoming that they have a statewide camp that every official has to go to to be postseason eligible. Is that the, is it that the answer? I don't I don't think so. I think we need to to do our, our due diligence as a uh, as a professional and do some professional development, which is whether it's summer camp, whether it's you know going to to a rules clinic or something like that. The other, how do we get those people that are eight hours away in Durango to, to see the same play that we see in Denver? I don't know if you can. I mean, that's just the, you see it at the NCAA level, you see, you know, across the country, but you also see it in high school levels across the country. I would love to tell Kevin that we can change that, but that's a, that's a long process. So. Did I did I divert your question as best I could? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. So Kevin apparently is okay with us emailing him. I'm not okay with that because that sets up a relationship. I would refer to some of the channels that uh, we have established people like that or game reports and things like that. What would be the assigners? I, I think if you're going to have communication at, with a coach, and even though Kevin's an athletic director and he stated he, he tries to keep those as separate as possible, I would still go through your area director and say, this is what, you know, this, this is my question to this coach. And as, being an area director for the last year and a half, I've been an area director for, you get, we get a lot of emails. We will channel them to the right Correction if we see fit. Not every question is going to be a great question. You know, I don't want somebody to say, you know, Kevin Bully, you did this to me the last game. And I'm going to send it forward that email directly to me. Um, not good for anybody. But I, I would say go through the area director, Mike, just to, because that's, the, I'm sorry for those out there. And, but the question is how do we, how do we communicate with coaches and, and athletic directors? I think that protocol should be go to your area director first. Can we unfriend him on Facebook? Un unfriend him? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kirk. Well, Kirk, now, if you're looking for an account, you, you might just leave him for a little bit just so you can keep that count. Uh, anything else? Thank you. 
to see in front of the coach, I'm standing around with the coach, is John called something. I have no idea what he saw. I cannot communicate for John. I apologize, Kevin Bowley, but I can't tell Kevin Bowley what John saw because I saw the same thing that Kevin Bowley saw. And was it a foul? I, I, trust, I, I, got, I trust John. And Denise is walking over there to shake, shaking her head saying, yep, you're right, and she, as she's going to take the ball to, to shoot the free throws. I got to trust my partners that we got the call right. And sometimes you got to tell a coach, the coach they had a great look at. So, but we, John may not know that Kevin's all excited about that call that he dismissed, that or Kevin thought he missed because he doesn't miss calls. And now he's got to go into the fire on something that he's pretty confident on and doesn't really want to talk. So, where are we at? Yeah. Talk to me. Um, I'm, I'm not very much of a good communicator, and so I'm constantly learning from you know those who have had that experience, whether it's yourself or. Uh, Don't look at me, Tom. I'm not a very good communicator. Um, and so, so you know, uh, uh, one of the you know with, with the collective here, you know, we having a lot of different talents and skills. So, so, sometimes it, it's uh, uh, good to you know, educate you know, the rest of us. You know, one, you know, to be better communicators, or you know, how to identify. Well, that's a coach. He's a jerk. You know, uh, uh, or, or if they have that, that reputation of you know, this one, you know, does do a great job for you. Just when you have to see how they are. Some parts of the office. Now, he got no idea who the coach is until you know, some game time. And then this, uh, it develops that as you know, he's yelling and screaming about everything. You know, and, and, and having, you know, or, or, or allowing him, you know, two magic bullets, silver bullets, you know. Uh, and after that, I mean, I asked him, you know, don't, don't use all, all these bullets in the first quarter. So, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm asking, you know. How do we, how do we communicate better, Tom? Is that in general? How do we, how do we, how do we, this is, I started fishing when I was a kid, freshman in college. I can talk to, I can talk to my friends, I couldn't talk to adults. And you get thrown into a situation where you're talking to adults, whether it's a 19 year or 18 year old kid, whatever. But the biggest thing that helped me talk in talking to officials was number one, talk, talk in reference to the book. Number two, keep your keep your your comments and your answers short. Yes, coach, no coach. By um, rule, coach, this is what the rule states. This is if this is what I saw by rule. That is the best way to keep yourself out of trouble. They're gonna at the JV level, those guys have never opened the book. At the varsity level, maybe 30% of them open the book if there's any coach out there. I apologize for any of you. But there, there is very few coaches understand the rules or get into the depth of the rule book like we do. So if we can keep it to that, you will hopefully keep yourself out of trouble. Does that help, Tom? Number one, you don't want to touch a coach. You never want to buddy up to him. Because to me, if I'm, if, if this is Kevin Bowling, that's Bob Wood over on the other side, and I go over to Kevin Bowling because he's being nice to me and say, Kevin, yeah, this is That's not good. Because Bob Wood's going to lock me out. If I just coach by rule, and then I can go to the other side and say to Bob Wood, coach by rule, they're getting the same thing. Because when coaches see, what we do on the floor. And they don't want to go slide it because of what I did on one side of the floor, I'm not going on the other side of the floor. So that's one of the things that we have to be conscious about as well. So. Good? Yeah. 
Good well, enough. Well. Um, we have Amanda Sire from uh, American Cancer Society to talk to us. And uh, welcome, Amanda. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. My name is Karen Person. I noticed there's a lot of folks joining from across the state. So I'm Amanda Sire. I work for the American Cancer Society. I've been there about seven years, and for the last probably four or five years, I've been working with the Officials versus Cancer Campaign. And I just want to start off by saying thank you. The dollars that you guys are raising every year for that campaign is truly making a difference in the lives of cancer patients. And I just wanted to share, I have some notes here in my phone, but I just wanted to share one quick story that we got from a patient that I think really um, shows the overall impact of what you guys are doing. So let me find that. Too many pictures of my two-year-old. Hold on. There we go. So, this is a note from Stanley. Calling the American Cancer Society and requesting trips with the Road to Recovery Program has been a blessing. We would not have been able to get John to his brain cancer treatments without the help of the American Cancer Society. We are on a fixed income, income, although we have stayed well and John retired from CDOT just before he was diagnosed. Margaret, our driver, has been an angel and has become a friend and made a huge impact on our quality of life. She is the volunteer who drives us the most. We are so fortunate to have the American Cancer Society and free rides to treatment. So that's our road to recovery program where we have volunteer drivers across the state and really even across the country who are taking cancer patients with all types of cancer to and from their treatments and their doctor's appointments. Um, an average ride um, because of the training for the volunteer and things like that cost the American Cancer Society about fifty dollars. So you can use that when you're thinking about you know doing it in your game pay or any other place to get on board with the officials campaign, you know, what it might take to give somebody a ride for treatment. Um, we also have a hotel partners program where people are traveling for their cancer treatments. We can provide them for free or we use cost place to stay. We have a lot of folks, um, Jeffin from the Grand Junction area, who go to our um, who go to Salt Lake City and stay in our Hope Lodge, which is an American Cancer Society facility where we don't have those Hope Lodges. We work with hotel partners to um, provide those for your reduced night stay. Um, and this is just a comment from one of the folks that benefited. The hotel staff treated me like a queen. The accommodations were great and they made it feel more like a vacation and less like treatment. So there's just a couple of examples of how we're helping um, patients through their cancer journey. We're also funding a lot of cancer research thanks to the dollars that you all have raised. Um, here in Colorado right now, we have I mean, it's just over $8 million in um, 16 different research grants. And a lot of those are through the University of Colorado, whether at the Anxious Medical Campus or um, up in Boulder. So, and they're working on everything from prevention to different treatment options. We even have a researcher who's looking at anxiety and survivorship and what are some things that we can do to help survivors through, um, you know, throughout their life when they're living longer now than they have in the past. So, um, you guys are truly making a difference. I know last year was just over, or, sorry, this year was still in 2018. Um, the 2018 campaign. Uh, just over $30,000 um, across the state of Colorado. Huge shout out to Colorado Springs um, folks. They raised the most out of all of the, um, all of the state of Colorado. But um, we're just super thrilled to be continuing the partnership with you guys. Um, I believe it's the last week of January for 2019. I have been designated again for the campaign. And if you guys are working with a um, team or a school that would be interested in doing more than, you know, um, kind of the norm for the official campaign, please reach out to us. We have staff that are available to work with those schools across the state and really um, help engage them. I know some of the schools have done, you know, maybe get a dinner beforehand to help raise more money or, um, you know, pass the budget during halftime and things like that. So please definitely reach out to me. I'll stick around after you guys are done today and I have uh, some business cards too. So I'd be happy to talk with you. Um, I did wanted to share, I've been working a lot with Johnny Epley and some folks across the country on this campaign because we do it in a few other states. And so new this year is these really neat coins. Um, they have the official versus cancer logo and the American Cancer 
Titan logo on one side and the Iowa logo on the other side. So we're going to start using these as a way to recognize those folks who have gone above and beyond for the campaign. So um, today we will, well, today and throughout, Kevin will help you get these distributed, but we'll give you these to the top 10 individuals um, who fundraised the most in 2018. So if you are looking to get a coin in 2019, try to be one of the top 10 across the state, and we will be sure to give you a coin um, next year. And then I know Gary has some folks that um, he's going to be getting these out to as well who have really helped um, make sure that the campaign was successful. Um, I also have a couple of certificate kits. Is Lauren Richmond here? Lauren Richmond? I guess not. All right, well, congrats to Lauren for going above and beyond. And then I do want to say a special thank you to Kevin and to Gary for really, um, you know, working alongside me these last couple of years and helping this campaign really grow um, here in Colorado. So thank you all. If you guys have any questions for me, I'd be happy to take them if they're appropriate for the general audience, or like I said, I'll stick around with you guys for All right. Um, Any other questions? I appreciate everybody coming out and uh, listening to us for three hours, and uh, that's the end. And uh, we'll see you out in the next season.